Ah, Strange World. Bit of a modern sabotage, that one. And an interesting release tale. Granted minimum marketing presence that led into an unavoidable flop in cinemas, only to reach the top of Disney Plus once unveiled there. It was never unpopular, just unknown. And though I'm sure there are all sorts of debates about why Disney rolled out things like that, we're here to discuss the scene that changed Strange World. The scene that flips the entire foundation of this movie on its head. So beware of spoilers if that kind of thing matters to you. Let's get into this. So the plot of Strange World has us witness a solar punk utopia looking like something straight out of a Studio Ghibli movie, just Disney-fied, while at its core being about the general divides across three different generations. You have the boomer Mr. Clad. Well, as I always say, exploration is snow joke. <laughs> wow. Seen as the arrogant explorer in a flashback who abandoned everything for his adventurous demands to reach across the icy mountains. Then you have his son, Searcher, Call me Searcher, who abandoned the explorer lifestyle to become a farmer with these new flowers he found. And lastly, we have Ethan, a little unsure of himself, but certainly not the farmer type. What? They sold out already? Oh, I knew I should have camped out. And as the crisis leads them down to this strange world, they come to discover lands, reunite, and gain a mutual enemy in the Reapers. And as we reach the two-thirds mark, all these classic plot points each come to a head. We came down here to save our farm, and that's what we're gonna do, together. Everyone has geared up with Pando, the magical seeds from before that these Reaper creatures are absolutely repelled by. But Ethan still remains a little conflicted. He's not quite farmer, not quite brazen explorer. All we really have to go on so far comes from a previous board game scene where Ethan's point was... The objective of Primal Outpost is to live harmoniously with your environment. I throw masonry stones at it and I shoot it with my brand new crossbow. <gasps> and we know it's all about generational differences, so of course we're tackling the plot point of... This is more your thing, Dad. This is our thing, Ethan. Father and son. As they stand out on the deck of their airship, green light billowing in from the open doorway, thematic to the vibe of nature that this whole movie has going on. Camera switching from high angle to low between the two of them in pretty standard fashion. It just doesn't feel right to me. And it comes from a place of morality and instinct. Something doesn't feel right to Ethan. And considering he is literally the only one of the crew to actually befriend and connect with an alien species on this, a strange world. Perhaps he would be more attuned to some sort of self-awareness of the whole situation. There's a plot twist hiding somewhere here. And after a moment of brooding in the dark, Ethan finally snaps back to stand his ground. Well then, maybe I'm not a farmer. What? It's not too much right now, just a simple source of light bleeding onto the screen, but it is a form of Ethan coming to a state of enlightenment. Shots closing in more and more each turn as the intensity of this conversation rises and Searcher is caught off guard. Where's all this coming from? This doesn't sound like you. Immediately deflecting and disregarding his child in your classic bad parenting move. It's a coping mechanism to avoid the worst of it, but still a poor move. And of course, that worst case scenario is hinted at, according to Searcher. I feel like I'm in my element when I'm exploring this world. All Ethan is saying is he likes it here, but Searcher sees it as a connection to the grandfather and his bad ways of exploring. Literally scoffing at the straw man version of Ethan's words rather than actively listening to him. And and right There's on cue. So much to discover here. And wait, wait, are, are, you, are, you, are you saying you want to be an explorer? Hey! Granddad Mr. Clad makes his appearance in the background, summoned by the mere word Ooh. of explorer. All the while, Searcher is getting more antsy, this time actually interrupting Ethan as he tries to make his point and getting stuck on a conclusion only he is jumping to. Hey! Is everything all right? And to stir up the pot a little more, our third generation joins in. The source of Searcher's detest, and not on exactly the same page as Ethan, either. Is this because of him? What? It is, isn't it? No. What did you say to Ethan? I, I didn't say anything. Yeah. All of Searcher's insecurities are coming out now as he believes his son to be influenced by the man he's grown bitter towards for leaving them all so many years ago. And if anything, it's melting down to become less about Ethan and Searcher, but Searcher and Jaeger. Granddad's name's Jaeger, by the way. There personal relationship is much more in tatters, and this is yet another place for that conflict to leak out. Damn, adults can't ever stop passing on their generational trauma. You do not want to be like him. The only thing he cares about is himself 
and conquering those mountains. In one swift swoop, Searcher can dictate his son and snap back at his father, who's obviously not having any of it, and turns away just as quickly. It's also interesting here the delivery of a lot of Searcher's lines, sort of stuttering and stumbling over his words, which I don't think he's been doing all that much through the rest of this film. It's a stylistic choice here that only grows more as the conflict continues. He interrupts, talks over others, and restarts his sentence again halfway through. He's a bit of a jittery character, even when he's trying to be controlling and authoritative. And this isn't you. Ethan, come back here! Ethan! Ethan! And the scale of our scene expands now Ethan storms off on a strop, choosing to ride the wave of whoopee cushion creatures. You know, I tried to look up the names for all these alien species, expecting some kind of piclopedia page of quirky Latin names on some wiki, but it turns out the most canon name most of these things have is Poop Pickle. God, Pikmin 4 can't come soon enough. Are you crazy? Hey, get on this skiff now. Leave me alone. And while Ethan is constantly on this path of avoidance, the camera prioritizes him. Cinematically, the film is agreeing with Ethan's side of the argument and happy to leave Searcher in the dust. It tracks Ethan landing on the, the poop pickles. It starts on him and pulls back when Searcher cruises into the frame, and it keeps Ethan in the forefront rather than switching to his dad's perspective when being commanding. Also, can I just say, I love all these airship technologies. The world of Strange World is one I seriously enjoy. I mean, legit, I probably spent the first half of this movie in a daze thinking about the imaginative elements of this world. The solar punk genre, all the airship functionalities. This genuinely could be a Studio Ghibli world just with Disney design characters in the middle. And for that, I am head over heels for the vibe this whole movie has. That being said, it is a Disney film, and this is a very generational family movie. So the actual plot and dialogue is playing it safe across every dimension. We've heard all of these lines before, just maybe not the word skiff for the flying motorbike. Hey, what is this all about? You, Dad! You! Oh my god, he said the thing! This isn't my thing, Dad, it's yours! The plot point people have been using since Mr. Clad was a kid, I expect. This movie is an interesting hybrid of a breathing world of imagination and a core that is so common denominator that I feel I'll enjoy a TV spin-off that they make of this movie more than the original, just for hopefully doing something faintly new for this land of opportunity. You just assume I'll follow in your footsteps, but you never asked me what I want! The shots are doing the classic thing as well, where as the argument heats up, the shots get closer and closer to the faces, but other than that, I guess tracking forwards to align with the naturally moving cameras. The camera too isn't doing too much for the emotional climax of this movie. You know, it's keeping it standard. And with it being standard, there is at least one piece of shining thematic resonance, as this conversation has happened twice. The first time, at the very start of the film a generation ago. But did you ever bother to even ask the crew if that's what they really wanted? The argument between father and son is being mirrored back in the prologue scene. It's funny, I came into this movie expecting this cliche plot point and was kind of relieved that it started immediately on it. It made me think, oh, okay, great, get it out of the way now, and then maybe they can play with the format in a more original way going forwards. Conquering those mountains is our legacy. No, Dad, it's yours. But no. The major point two thirds in is just this same cliche marker. The world around this moment is great. I'm just not a fan of the core. But back to the present day, and now the close ups are done, it's time for the two shots. You're a kid. You don't know what you want. I know I don't want to be you. <gasps> And there it is the official, official line of this trope. Hey, how did it sound an hour ago? Enough. You're my son. But I'm not you. Hmm. A little less dramatic, but still gets the point across, I guess. Thank you for making it halfway through this vid. If you're hooked for more, come subscribe. Check out our community Discord server or see us live on the channel tomorrow. And Searcher remembers it as he finally shuts and thinks on it. And for about 27 seconds, the dialogue stops. It's nothing but a collection of sighs and pauses. It's Searcher looking shocked. It's the skiff floating tiny against the background of crystallized stalagmites, and it's the clouds coming in to render the background irrelevant. They're in their own little bubble now, and the majesty of this environment is the last thing they're thinking about. Plus, it looks dramatic too. Cheekily transitioning us from that wide angle to a slightly closer one, and in a moment of emotional clarity at least, the two just calm down and sit. 
facing away from each other since it's pretty hostile still, even if they're both more sad than angry. The soft music comes fading in as Searcher reflects and responds on more reasonable grounds. It's time for the emotional heart to heart. I worked so hard to be the exact opposite of my dad. And, uh... Looks like I ended up just like him. Whoop, there it is. You'd really think someone with this founding belief of their father would make sure the exact same words wouldn't spin round to them too, but people are stupid. I just wanted so badly to build you a legacy you could be proud of. And as Searcher makes this strange example of an excuse, the camera twirls a little to involve his son a little more. And so the slight head turns are more noticeable as an indirect way to look at each other. Now with us being behind Ethan as we're looking on from Searcher's perspective. Stop talking. Ethan, I'm trying to apologize. Here. Dad. And from one cliche to another, now we have some dramatic irony. This perspective gives us a view of the change in lighting and cloud composition, and at least Ethan's reaction to something in the distance, whilst Searcher remains oblivious from his angle. It's the end of our emotional conversation, and thank God! Honestly, it feels like a Disney checklist at this point. In getting distracted on stupid things like family and emotions, the two have unknowingly cruised blindly through the clouds and out to the other side, to the one explored place that Jaeger was so desperate to find all those years ago. It is progress on a geological scale with news that may shake the world as they know it, beyond just luminescent plants. Nothing but water out there. They've reached the edge of the world, and as the clouds dissipate, they find endless ocean. Whether intentional or not, Jaeger's son would be there for the discovery of the explored world. And even more so than that, it turns out the entire time, their world as they know it has been atop a giant living creature. This is the real discovery that shakes the ground beneath them. And boy, doesn't it make the whole world of Strange World so interesting? First, it's showcased as a wide shot of the moss moving behind the boys, before switching to a wider high angle as we see all the more moss moving collectively upwards. And then it switches now to a crane shot pulling upwards to mimic a giant beast standing, looking down on father and son. Not quite accurate at scale or perspective, but the theming is still on point. And then it stretches out even more. Super high angle, super tiny bike, splitting across the frame, an endless ocean on the left, and a rummaging foliage on the right, and finally giving us a view we can perceive with a super low angle on a revealed layer of eyeball underneath the trees. Angled for maximum scale, of course. A simple shot of of only greenery moving, so large and yet not even the relevant part of the subject somehow, before yet another super high and wide shot of the bike, now with the titanic eyeball cascading across 60% of the frame and ending it off with the money shot, with the boys standing stunned as the camera spins around them and pulls a mile away to reveal the full view of the beast's gigantic, galactic looking iris and pupil. Music swelling to its full climax of wonder. You can even see the reflection of the ocean in its pupil. Suddenly, the little squabbles of family drama seem imperceivably small. It's such a great reveal and really gets the imagination going, more so than the dialogue ever dreamed, at least. That's an eye, right? Yeah. One sees it in fear, the other in wonder. And I imagine if Jaeger was here, he'd try to kill it. A demon spider? Kill it! But it's yet another element that makes the universe of Strange World so enthralling to me. A real Studio Ghibli spin, environmental messaging and all. You know what this means, right? It's judging me? And Searcher has boiled down to his unintellectual self. But even still, this is the revelation that practically flips the understanding of this a strange world on its head, as this idea can roll out into several different conclusions. The windy force that we were in? That's the lungs. And, and the acid lake? That's the stomach! You know, I'm kind of mad at myself for not clicking on this sooner, because I totally had a thought about how this seemed quite cell-like at one point, but I was just going with the flow, I think. Maybe the actual cliché plot was just bashing me down too much. But as Searcher continues to act solely as comic relief... And this giant eye must be its eye. We actually come to the real, practical implications of this discovery. The Reapers aren't monsters. 
they're an immune system. The evil tentacle creatures they've been dealing with this entire time are just a natural part of this colossal body, attacking invaders in the hopes of recovering their humongous host. And the find of a hive of monsters attacking the Pando source they've been using is in fact the remnants of a heart under attack and trying to be recovered. All this time, we've been living on the back of this giant creature? Yeah, and Pando is killing it. You know what could have been really nice here? Some visuals. There is that one low angle of them looking up at the mountain, but everything's explained. All the different descriptions of these creative biological environments are just mentioned. It's an exposition dump told with a pretty yet basic backdrop. We don't even look at the eye again, just the sea. And it's such a shame because I'm really invested. I want to see more Titan continents in the movie industry. This is my jam. Give me more solar punk. Don't just make me replay Xenoblade again. The world is so interesting and inviting. At least the surface is to me. Even the transitions seem to know it's a quirky fantasy world. They full on got a Star Wars transition involved. And yet at the basis of this movie is just a simple checklist, a watered down and tired plotline slapped into this magnificent world. But to end off our scene, this transition has us recontextualize the operation of saving the Pando as the green spray of nature and health now looks like the classic bad guy green. Now we can understand the concern Splat was trying to display right before the start of the scene. And from here, it's a matter of informing the troops, handling a coup, tackling the problem and saving the world as the giant tortoise thing it is. The creature's immune system has no way to defend itself. We need to hurry. You know, when I first watched this movie, I was pretty smitten with it. You've heard me gushing all throughout this movie. I love the surface world and I love the Titan reveal. I love the Studio Ghibli vibes and I love the characters too. Putting in some unique entries of upfront LGBT characters, less conventional leader characters, and of course, all sorts of diversity and relationships. Those are all solid pluses for me and emblematic of a Disney that's trying to make some steps of progress. But at the same time, this movie is basic. It's a cliche trope fest. I'm not actually that crazy about the underworld. I, I want more of the surface. So, you know, I see we have a good chunk of artists in our community. So here's a request for you. Send me some strange world fan art. Show me the potential this world could have without all the checklist items in it. We have an art channel on our Discord server to use as an outlet, and I want to use it more. So if you have the urge, come showcase your work. And perhaps I'll plug it in a future video. But this 50-50 review feels like this isn't as much an attack on the creators at Disney. The actual employees on the ground seem like some of the most talented people in the industry. And I wouldn't be surprised if earlier drafts of this movie showed something more nuanced, but what this truly feels like to me is a classic case of executive meddling somewhere in the middle. Someone higher up asked for a more simplistic plot for basic families to all enjoy, with an environmental message that is there, but not really clarified or applicable. How do the people on the surface react to losing their renewable energy plant? Is there not any pushback or ramifications? What's the replacement solution? We don't see any of it. The world just moves on. Unestablished and shallow doubt. This is the scene that literally literally changes Strange World, flipping the concept of the world on its head with its revelation, and it's also the emotional climax between father and son. It was the no-brainer choice of a scene for me to pick, but I also feel perhaps it's a shining peek at the potential this movie had lying under the surface, that can only rear its head occasionally, when it's not smothered in Disney's unoriginality. Or hey, even if the writers were always bland and uninteresting with their pitch, we can at the very least attribute some exec meddling to the marketing of this movie. Is it because they had little faith in the idea? Is it because there's an openly gay character for the protagonist? Is it because Disney wants to test Disney Plus numbers on a Disney movie instead of just a Pixar movie? Who knows? Whatever the case, it's not looking too great as a PR move from Disney. And I hope each popular view this movie gets through this side access streaming route can be seen as a middle finger to any exec that's been pushing this project down. I love the world of Strange Worlds. I just wish it opened up to its full potential instead of being a clone of movies from generations past. I guess everyone ends up like their forefathers eventually. For now, I'd best end it off here. My name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.